in our home fellowships, we had adopted DMM, right? You all remember DMM? You all heard of DMM? Yeah? Okay, so uh, we learned this from Elder Dorai. And this morning, at the 7.30 a.m. service, Elder Dorai told us that he learned it from the speaker, Cynthia Anderson. Okay, so we are very privileged this morning uh, to hear direct from the source of DMM, right? So Cynthia Anderson is an international speaker who has spoken to an audience of uh, 10,000 plus, founded Global Enterprises and created an online course that has trained thousands of students across 90 nations. Okay, so that, that includes us, yeah? Uh, with a master's degree in global leadership from Fuller Seminary and over 30 years of field experience in Asia, she is a sought-after trainer on the topic of disciple multiplication and church planting movements. She has helped church leaders across denominations and fellow believers to multiply uh, disciples and begin discipleship movements in their areas. All right, now here's an interesting fact. She has also finished 10 half marathons on three different continents. Wow. Yeah. Okay, Cynthia has uh, authored a book, The Multiplier's uh, Mindset. Thinking differently about discipleship, right? So the book actually challenges us uh, and gives us a new mindset, you know, on making disciples and multiplying. Uh, as many of our home fellowships are already, you know, doing DMM, uh, I would encourage uh, all our home fellowship leaders, as well as our members, uh, as well as you know our church members who are interested in uh, discipleship making and multiplying, you know, especially in line with our M100, right? I would encourage everyone to uh, get a copy of this book, okay? So the book is available down in the basement, right? And uh, so do go and pick up a copy uh, after the service, okay? Uh, so before I ask uh, Cynthia to come out, just want to introduce uh, her team that's with her today. So. It's so husband Todd. Maybe you can just stand and wave and uh, yeah, we can acknowledge you, right? And uh, we also have Jeff and Rachel, All right? Hi, Jeff, Rachel. Yeah, they've been in our church before. Okay, welcome. And I'll just pass the time down to Cynthia. Amen. Praise the Lord. It is so good to be here at FGA, and this is such an amazing church, and what a joy to be with you this morning. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, and I do hope you'll get a copy of the book. Uh, we only have a limited supply, so be sure to grab one right away after service. What if I were to say to you today that out of your deepest, darkest pain could come the greatest fruitfulness. Amen? Our God is a God who does that kind of thing. He's a God who takes pain and he turns it into incredible fruitfulness for his kingdom. The title of my message is When Pain and Passion Meet, How God Propels His People Toward Powerful New Paradigms. Try to say that fast to your neighbor, how God propels his people toward powerful new paradigms. Yeah, if you try to say it fast, it's a bit of a tongue twister, yeah? But that's what we're going to be talking about today. God is propelling his people towards changes in the way they think about him, about disciple making, and about how to see his kingdom grow. When we think of pain, one of the things that comes to my mind right away is a painful situation that all of us went through globally. It's the COVID pandemic, not so long ago, yeah? And during this time of pain that we all suffered, God was working. Now, I don't believe that God caused COVID, but I do believe that he used COVID to shift many of us into new things that we would never have done before if it wasn't for the pandemic. Yeah, God uses painful things 
to shift us and move us into new wineskins and into new ways of thinking about life. He did that in my husband and my life and in Jeff and Rachel's life. Actually, during the pandemic, when it was first really uh, advancing, we were all together in Brazil for a, a Youth with a Mission meeting. We were there gathered in Brazil, and suddenly all of the different countries began to close their borders, right? One after another, borders were closing. Even the borders of the states in Brazil were closing. And we hurried back to the United States, which, states, which was closer. My husband and I actually live in Thailand. And we got stuck in the USA for 11 months. We couldn't return to our home. And every month we were watching to see, you know, would the doors open again to Thailand? Could we go back home? 11 months of waiting and wondering. And I know here in Malaysia, you face similar kinds of things. It was a difficult time. I don't know about you, but we lost friends to the pandemic, those who passed away. It was a hard time. And yet out of that pain, God was pivoting or shifting his global church into some new things that we had never done before. And for us, one of them was training people online. And we moved from training people in person to training them in online environments. It was something we never would have thought of doing, and yet God knew what he was doing during that time. See, back in 2019, I prayed a dangerous prayer. I pray it every year <laughs> with a little fear and trembling because I never know what God's going to say, but I say, God, show me the one thing you want me to do this year that will have the greatest impact. And in 2019, what the Lord put on my heart was for me to take the training we'd been doing in the field, in India and Pakistan and Bangladesh and Sri Lanka and Nepal and different countries where we'd been working, and to take that training and put it into an online course. Well, I, I honestly had no idea if 10 people might do that course. I didn't know anything about online courses. But I simply knew that if God says to do it, what do we do? We obey. Yeah? And so I said, yes, God. And I learned how to, you know, create an online training, put up a course online. The first cohort, which happened in 2019, we had about 50 people do that cohort. We ran it again in 2020. In the beginning of 2020, we had another 80 students. And then in March or April of 2020, the pandemic hit. And all of our on-site trainings, in-person trainings, all across the globe shut down. And we were ready. We were ready with this online course to train disciple makers, to train people how to launch movements of disciples and out of that pain came great fruit. Today, we've trained over 4,500 leaders through this online course in how to multiply disciples, including Elder Dorai from this church. We train people all over the world in 90 nations. Those people have done what we trained them in, and we've seen over 25,000 baptisms take place through ordinary people who've been trained. Yeah, praise God. Over 3,400 new groups and churches. God is a God who can bring great fruit through great pain if we will simply obey him. There's two primary reasons that we as human beings are willing to change. One is pain, which we've been talking about and the second one is passion. These two things motivate and catalyze people to be willing to change, and that's what we'll be talking about today. In the first chapter of the book, Multiplier's Mindset, I talk about five key agents of change in a disciple's life. The first one we've already referenced, and that is a major crisis, Pand global pandemic, it might be What's happening today, we see flooding and hurricanes and major crisis shifts us, so we have to do things differently, right? Another thing could be a God encounter. I once went to the nation of Israel and I was talking to a woman 
And she told me how she was at the, the wailing wall. And as she stood at that wall, she had this encounter with God. It was like she visibly felt the presence of God, and that changed her forever, right? God encounters change us. How many of you would raise your hand and say you've been changed by an encounter with God? Amen? Yeah, God encounters shift us, and they make us willing to do things that we maybe have never thought we would do before. Another reason or an agent of change in our lives can be a scripture encounter. As I was writing this book, I interviewed different uh, movement leaders around the world, and one man that I interviewed, his name was Dr. Victor Chowdhury. He's a medical doctor who... In his uh, 60s, he began to do church planting, and he, he really knew God was calling him to be involved in church planting, so he, he looked for a book that he could read about church planting. And Uncle Victor, we call him Uncle Victor, he, he said to me, Cynthia, I was looking for that book, but there's not many Christian bookstores in my town. So I went home and was complaining to my wife, where can I find a book on church planting? And she looked at me and she said, Victor, have you tried this one? And he, she said, read the book of Acts. It's all about church planning. And so that's what he did. And Uncle Victor began to read the book of Acts. And as he read it, there was revelation from God. And he, he said, you know, what I see in the book of Acts is not really what I see in the world today in the way people are doing church. I want to do it like the book of Acts. And it was an encounter with scripture that caused him to shift into new mindsets and new ways of operating. Another thing that can cause us to shift is what we call a point of desperation or a dark night of the soul even. Some people might even refer to it as depression. I know I've talked to those who've seen movements who... They had this point in their life where they'd been working hard in the, the fields and they'd been working hard to see people come to Christ and nothing was happening or what was happening was so small compared to the great need. And in this point of desperation, they said, God, show me a different way. And then God led them to people who trained them or discipled them in how to multiply disciples in their area. The fifth one is a provocative question. And again, I talk about this in the book. But there was, again, a man who was in India, and he was doing disciple-making and church planning, and things were multiplying well among a particular people group. You know, they had several generations of churches that planted churches that planted churches. But one day, his coach or his mentor came to him and said, why do you hate such and such people group. He said, what? I, I don't hate them. And his, his friend said, well, maybe you don't hate them, but you certainly don't love them. I've never seen you pray for them, even once, and I've prayed with you many times. And I've never heard you share the gospel with them. Why do you hate that people group? A provocative question that shifted him to be willing to do new things. And after that, he began to work among that, that ethnic group, and they began to see fruit. And a whole new stream of the movement began among this group that previously he had never worked before. God shifts us through many different things. We know in 2 Peter 3, 9, it says, God does not desire that any would perish. Say the word any. A little bit louder. Any. What does any mean? Any means any, right? All. He doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants all to come to repentance. We know this is the heart of God. And yet today, evangelism in many churches is on the decline in many parts of the world. Definitely, if you look to my home country, the United States, in America, evangelism is in steep decline. People are afraid to share the gospel. They don't want to offend anyone, right? 
And even talking about evangelism, while well, years past we used to have classes on evangelism, today evangelism is declining in our nation and in many other parts of the world where American Christianity has been exported. Tom Rainier, who is a researcher and author about the church, he says, a church without evangelism becomes a church that does not make disciples because there are no new Christians to disciple. I want to ask you a question today. How much does lostness bother us? How much does lostness bother us? Do you wake up in the middle of the night disturbed about those who don't know Jesus? Does it bother you enough to move out of your comfort zone and share the gospel with that person, even if it's a little uncomfortable for you? Does lostness bother us? Just think for a moment on a scale of one to 10. Evaluate in your own mind, what is your pain or passion level in regard to lostness? One being, I know I'm very passive. I have almost no sense of being bothered by the fact that there are so many millions in my nation who don't know Christ. It doesn't really bother me that much, if I'm honest. And 10 being, I am on fire, full of boldness. I, I, I wake up every morning thinking about how can I reach the lost. Where are you at? Just think of a number even right now. Do you all have a number in your mind? Wherever you're at, God wants to turn up the volume a little bit today. Amen? He wants to increase our heart to burn with the things that burn in his heart. He wants to shift our paradigms. Peter, the apostle Peter, is someone whose paradigms shifted. You know, Peter never really arrived, but Jesus was continually positioning him and shifting him and repositioning him for greater fruitfulness. There's many different paradigm shifts we could talk about that happened in the life of Peter, but there's two that I want to emphasize this morning. One takes place in Luke chapter 5, verse 1 to 11, and it's a shift from fishing for fish, which Peter originally did for his job, to fishing for people. The second shift happened in Acts chapter 10, where Peter shifted from only ministering to the Jews to ministering to the Gentiles also. Let's look first at Luke chapter 5, and if you have your Bibles, you could open it to that. Luke chapter 5, verse 1 to 11. I'll read. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. So imagine for a moment with me, I'll pause there. You know, I worked in, in India and Nepal, and you know, when, when you're speaking to a group of people, sometimes a crowd will gather. And uh, that's what's happening to Jesus. He's speaking, this crowd gathers, and behind him there's a lake. You know, you can just kind of imagine this crowd is gathering and he's stepping back a little bit, and they're, you know, they're pushing forward. They want to hear him speak, and he's backing up a little bit more. And he's looking around, and he sees this boat and this man who has just finished fishing, and he's cleaning his nets. And that's Simon Peter, and he says to him, hey, can I borrow your boat for a minute? Right? And Simon Peter says, sure. You know, and so he gets into the boat. They push it out a little bit, and he sits down. He teaches the people. Then he gets back up after he has finished, and he starts talking to this fisherman named Simon. And it says, when he finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Now, think for a moment what Simon must have been thinking. You know, here's this rabbi who's, you know, 
a carpenter, but he's turned rabbi, and he's been preaching. And preachers preach and fishermen fish, right? And he's thinking, what are you doing telling me how to fish? But I just imagine that Peter probably was also thinking, as any man who's worked all night and caught nothing would, what is my wife going to say when I go home with no fish today? And he's like, oh, I really don't want to go home and tell her I didn't catch anything. Once again, we came up empty in our business. And Jesus says to him, put out your net. He says, go into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. And Peter, with all these things going on in his mind, he takes a risk of faith. And he says this, he says, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. Because you say so. My friends, we need to have that attitude in our hearts that whatever the master commands, even if it doesn't make any sense, we're going to do it because Jesus is telling us to. Amen? That's where fruitfulness comes from. And we see that Peter obeys the master, and it says, when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat. The biggest catch of fish that Peter had ever caught in his whole life came that day because he chose to obey the master, to do what he was prompting him and saying to do. And after he brings in the catch, he falls at his knees and he says, away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. And the Lord speaks to him and he says, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. A new calling, a new day had dawned in Peter's life. God had shifted him from fishing for fish to now he would fish for people. Another paradigm shift happens in Peter's life later on in his life at what we might call the height of his ministry. It takes place in Acts chapter 10. And if you read Acts chapter 9, you'll see that that was where he had raised Tabitha from the dead. Now, I don't know how many of you have raised someone from the dead, but that's, that's a pretty, like, peak of ministry, wouldn't you say? Like, you know, you're moving in the supernatural. You're seeing incredible things happen. This was not a time when Peter was, you know, not a well-established minister of the gospel. He was someone who was moving in the power of God. And yet God wasn't finished with him yet. God had more that he wanted to release through his life. And some of you, you have been believers for quite some time. Some of you have seen supernatural things happen through you. Some of you have even pioneered this church. You know, this amazing church that has sent out so many missionaries around the world. You've done great things for God, but God would say to you today, I have more for you, my friend. But you have to be willing to be open to new things. And Peter, that day, it says that he was praying on the roof, right? He's seeking God. He's praying on the roof. And I don't know if this happens to you. It happened to Peter. It happens to me. He got hungry while he was praying. Anybody else? Sometimes I'm hungry while I'm praying. And he gets hungry. And while he's getting hungry, he sees this vision. And this sheet comes down from heaven but it's not all the kind of food that he's used to eating. It's all these strange things that he's never eaten before and that Jewish people weren't allowed to eat. And he hears this voice from heaven that says, Peter, kill and eat. He's like, what? No, 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 I don't eat that kind of thing. That's not what I do. And again, the voice comes from heaven, Peter, kill and eat. And while he's contemplating these things, he then, you know, has this knock on the door. And it's men from Cornelius' house. And the Lord says, there's some men who are knocking on your door, and you're to go with them. And Peter goes down, and he finds these men, and they, they say, please come to this man named Cornelius' house. He's a God-fearing man, and he wants to hear from you. He's had an angelic vision. 
telling him to come and call you to speak to him. So Peter, he's still trying to figure out what this is all about, but he says, okay. So he goes with these men to Cornelius' house, and as he's sharing about the story of Jesus, all of a sudden, what happened? The Holy Spirit falls, and they start to speak in other tongues. Now, I love that this church is a church that speaks in tongues. <laughs> you guys believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. I love that about this church. Well, there's Peter, and he's like, well, they've been filled with the Holy Spirit, even though I didn't even know these kind of people could actually become Christians. So what's to hinder us from baptizing them? And he tells his friends who are with him, go baptize them in water now, since God has already received them. He says in verse 34, I now realize that God doesn't show favoritism, that he is for all peoples. And Peter's paradigm shifts from only Jews to Gentiles also that day. I don't know where you're at in this spectrum of different things that might be happening in your life, but I do know this. Desperation releases the new while passivity releases nothing. God allows us to come to points of desperation so that we're ready for the new things he wants to release in our life. As I was praying for this service and this church this week, I, I felt like God gave me a word for you guys, and the word that he spoke was this, that he is looking for sons of Issachar, those who discern the times and they know what to do. In 1 Chronicles 12, 32, that's where we find the story of David's mighty men, and it speaks about the sons of Issachar, that they were those kind of people. They discerned the times, and they knew what to do. And God said to me, in this church, now is the time, this is the right time, this is the right people, and this is the right place for what I want to release. Now is the time. Will we rise up and will we move with the things that God is doing? See, there's a cosmic shift that's happening in the world today. It's a shift that God is allowing and that God is bringing. And yet, many of us are longing for the old normal. You know, I look back on certain times in my history and I think, wow, that was such an incredible time where God moved. But God is a forward-looking God, right? And he wants us to move forward in the things that he's releasing to us. He's a God of history, but he's also a God who always shifts us into new things that he's doing. Sometimes, you know, after the pandemic, I was just like, Lord, I just want to get back to normal. Normal church, normal life, normal travel. You know, and, and I think that's, that's natural. And yet, we need to be willing to say, God, what is it you're doing today? I want to be moving with you. God's shifting us to a multiplier's mindset today. He's shifting the church globally into new models of church. And like the sons of Issachar, who were with David, we need to ask ourselves today, are we moving with God? Or are we stuck in our old paradigms? You know, we risk missing what God is doing in the world if we get stuck in the old and can't move forward into the new. I want to move with God. I want to be there in what he's doing. Today, God is moving his body into multiplication instead of only addition. He's moving us into greater multiplication. Now, what's the difference between addition and multiplication, right? Now, that's not a math question, but when it comes to the church, what's the difference? What does it look like? Well, I want to illustrate this for you just for a moment, if I can come down off the platform. And I picked on you guys last time. I'm going to go over here. <laughs> so this is what addition looks like. 
Let's say that I am living in a neighborhood and I start to reach out and share the gospel with someone. Can you stand up? I share the gospel with her and she becomes a believer and I'm like, hallelujah, that's great. I'll disciple you. And then I go over here and I share with another person and I lead her to the Lord. She's a little bit harder, yeah? You know, it takes a little longer, but she finally believes. <laughs> and she comes and I, I say, hey, come, come. Do you know her? You guys can be friends, yeah, and I, I'm going to start a church here. Let's have a church. And I go over here, and I share the gospel with this guy, and he also becomes a believer. I say, come, come, come to our church. Come on over here. We're having lots of fun together, good fellowship. And I form a church, right? And I think, wow, you know, she has great leadership giftings. She's growing well. I'm going to send her to Bible college yeah, and four years, you go ahead and go to Bible college. When you come back, we'll make you the pastor of this church, okay? And meantime, I find one more person who comes, yeah, and the church is growing, not real fast, but, you know, over about 10 years, I have a church of about 300 people, right? She goes back, and she comes, and, okay, we're going to commission you as the pastor of this church, and after 10 years, I'm able to commission her, and we, we praise God, we build a building, we have a nice worship band, he's a worship leader, you know, and we have a great time together, and then, wow, I'm tired, you know, that was a lot of work to build that church, you guys just stay right there, stay there, yeah, and so I think, oh, okay, I'm going to take a sabbatical, I go and have a year's break, take a sabbatical, then I think, okay, now I'm going to go start in a new place, so I go out here, and I start sharing the gospel, they speak a language that I don't know, you know, so I have to learn the language. That takes me two, three years already, yeah? And then I start sharing, and, and uh, I don't really know their culture, but I'm trying my best, and God gives me finally one disciple. And then, yeah, yeah, stand up. And uh, I start discipling him, and, and uh, yeah, are you his wife? Yeah, okay, and he, he also brings his wife to church, and we start a church and we rent a little building, you know, and then uh, they also bring some more people, and we, we start training them. You guys look like youth leaders. We're going to make you youth leaders in the church. We start a different program, and she also comes to our church because she hears the great worship music, you know. She comes. Come on over here. Join our church. Okay. And now after another, this is a little faster because I'm learning, you know. So after five years... I planted another church. Now, how many years went by? Ten for that one. One year sabbatical. Five for this one. How many years? Sixteen years. How many churches do I have? Two. Okay. Am I a good church planter? <laughs> Not bad, huh? Yeah, I'm so glad. You guys are very supportive, okay? Okay. So this is what we call addition church planting, right? This is the way that most people do church planting. It's the way that we used to do it also, right? But there is a different way, okay? You guys can sit down. You can sit down as well for a minute. Okay, so this time what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here and I share the gospel with this sister and she receives Christ and I say, you know, do you know anyone else? Like, do you have a husband or children or anyone who might like to study the Bible together? Do you? Yeah, is he your husband? Yeah, do you think he'd like to join us and we could study the Bible together? So, yeah, I say, you know what? I'm just going to teach you how to do this. Do you, do you have anyone else? Maybe some neighbors? Do you have some neighbors who might like to also? Would you like to come and join us as well? Yeah, and um, you know, I'm going to teach you how to lead this group, and I'll lead it the first time, first two, three times, and then you can do it on your own, because I'm going to do it in a really simple way. Does that sound good? Okay, so I lead them, I show them. Okay, after three times, I think you guys can lead it yourself. I'll come back and check on you, okay? Just keep meeting, and after you're finished, feel free to share with others too. So just stay there, okay? <laughs> then... I'm going to go over here. That took me only six weeks to start that group, right? 
And I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to start sharing again with another couple, right? And I share with her, and I say, yeah, do you have a husband who might like to also hear? Yeah, so then I'm sharing with them, and how about you? Do you have any friends or neighbors that you might like to also invite for our, our Bible study? All right, and so then I'm, I'm training them, and I started this group, and I say, no, you guys just keep going, okay? You do this one on Tuesdays, that one's on Mondays, yeah? And then I'm going to go over here. I'm going to start another group. I'm going to start here, right? And I share with you. Can you stand up? And I start another group right here, and I teach them how to know Jesus and do Discovery Bible study. Do you have any friends or neighbors you might like to also invite? Yeah, you have some. Okay. Good. Yeah, can you guys join? All right, and I'm going to teach you. You guys just study this passage really simple way. Read the passage two times, then discuss it, these simple questions, right? Let me know if you have any trouble. I'll come back and check on you. Now, it's only three months. How many groups did I start? Three, yeah? Okay, now, wait, wait. Don't sit down, sir. No, no, no. <laughs> now... I want you guys to go out and start new groups, right? The same thing. It was so easy. Whatever I've been teaching you, you go and teach to others. Can you do that? Yeah? Okay. So can you go and start new groups, each of you? <laughs> find some new people. Start a new group. Go, go find a new group. I think he's very open. Yeah. <laughs> and you, and you guys, I'm commissioning you. You guys go start a new group also. Each one of you start your own group. Oh, go start a group. Yeah. Go start a new group. Find some people. Yeah, and you too. You're not going to get escape, yeah? <laughs> you guys start a new group. Go find some new people and start a new group. What's happening? What's happening now in just two years? How many groups do we have? Wow, many groups. I can't even count them. So many groups are multiplying. Okay, give yourselves a big hand. You can sit down. Thank you. This is the difference between addition church planting and multiplication and movements. Man. God is using ordinary people to start new groups of disciples. And they're not bringing them into the church building. They're meeting in tea shops. They're meeting in factories. They're meeting under a tree, you know? They're meeting wherever they can meet. And God is multiplying his kingdom. So why do we need this change? Why is it so vital that we make this shift? There's one word that answers that question. It's lostness. Lostness is the reason we must change. Because as we look at the growth of the church in comparison to the growth of the population, we see that the gap is increasing every day. The church is growing. We celebrate that. But it is growing at an addition rate while the population is multiplying. And what that means is every single day, there are more people who don't know Jesus than there were the day before. If we don't embrace a multiplication approach to disciple making and church planning, more and more millions of people will die without Jesus next year than this year. It is urgent, it is critical because of lostness. In my book, I talk about three areas where we need to shift our mindsets. We need to change our mindsets about God and ourselves. We need to change our mindsets about others. And we need to change our mindsets about how we make disciples. And the first section, it spells feed. And we talk about a mindset of faith. God can do it here. God can do it through me. A mindset of expand. Don't ask God for school books when he can give you a Tata truck. There's a story that goes with that. You have to buy the book to read it. Uh, a mindset of enough. I don't need more stuff. I already have enough to multiply. 
and a mindset of discover. Don't bring the gospel to save the lost. Discover the gospel already at work among the lost. Really briefly, I want to talk about this first mindset of faith. God can do it here. God can do it through me. You know, many times when we talk about multiplying movements and you hear these stories of, you know, tens of thousands that are coming to the Lord in, in places like the big country or, you know, to the north, or we, we hear it in Africa or we hear it in India and we think, that's amazing, it's happening there, but it couldn't happen in my place and my people. Or if we even think it could happen here, we're tempted to think that it could happen through other kind of people, but it couldn't happen through me. God wants to confront that mindset and give us a new mindset of faith that says God can do it here. God can do it through me. But there are some common barriers that hinder us from being willing to become a disciple maker. Sometimes we'll say, I'm not holy enough. I've made mistakes in the past. Or maybe I don't know enough about the Bible. Like, what if they ask me questions that I can't answer? We're so afraid. Or maybe you say, I'm too old. Or maybe I'm too young. Or here's a big one for Malaysia, right? I'm too busy. Malaysians are busy people. So are Americans. I'm too busy. How could I ever make time for that? God has ways that we can integrate disciple-making into our life. He uses busy people to multiply his kingdom. This one is an excuse I use for many years. I'm an introvert. Any introverts in the house? Yeah? <laughs> I don't even like to talk to people on my day off. How could I go out and share the gospel? I want to read a book in a corner. God is raising up even introverts to be disciples who multiply. Or maybe you just say, I have no idea what I'm doing when it comes to multiplying disciples. If that's you, we have a course that you can take, and Elder Dorai is also right here, willing and ready to train you. I want to tell you a story as we come to a close, and maybe the worship team can go ahead and come up. It's a story about an elderly couple. They, they were in Hawaii, they had retired, and they were living in a retirement community. They were there in this retirement community and serving, and they thought, you know, our time is over. Let the young people do it. But they were challenged that God wants to use everyone to make and multiply disciples. And they were praying. They said, Lord, we're willing, but we don't know how. And the Lord gave them this idea. Why don't you have a, a bingo night? Everybody likes to play bingo in their, that retirement community. We're going to play have a bingo night and offer pizza, and through that, we'll build relationships with our neighbors and get to know them, and we'll just share a little bit of the gospel with them and see what happens. You know, like Peter, cast your net out into the deep, and they said, okay, we're going to do it. And so they started this bingo night, and they started having pizza, and they would pray before they would start, and sometimes they'd share a little story and say, hey, let's talk about it around our tables for a few minutes. And then one day, they asked this Buddhist lady who had been coming regularly to the bingo night. She really enjoyed it. And they asked her, they said, would you like to pray for our pizza and our gathering here tonight? And she thought, well, I've never really prayed to Jesus before. But, you know, when I hear you guys pray, you pray, our Father I've never thought of God as my father before. You pray like you know him. And as she said that, tears began to stream down her cheek. She said, I want to know him that way. I want to know God the way you know him. And they gathered around her and began to pray for her. And this Buddhist lady put her trust in Jesus that day. And they invited her into a discovery Bible study and began to disciple her and train her how to follow Jesus. And that group started other groups in that retirement community. And that other group started other groups there as people led others to the Lord there. And then it spread to other retirement communities. 
And they started a pizza and bingo night. <laughs> and people began to come to the Lord. And it spread to four different retirement communities in Hawaii. It began to spread as more and more heard the good news. And there's another mindset shift that's really, really important. It's the mindset of all. All are appointed to accomplish all activities. It says in 1 Peter 2.9, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You, my friends, are royal priests. I want you to say to your neighbor, you are a royal priest. That's a big deal. You are a minister of the kingdom. Not only the pastors and elders and leaders. Every one of you, if you call Jesus your savior, you are a minister of the kingdom, a royal priest. One who walks in the authority of God. Whether you're old, whether you're young, whether you're a lay person. And I love that history in this church about lay people can be used of God. Let's reactivate that in our day. God is using ordinary people. We're going to come to a close in just a minute. But I want to tell you one last story. Is that okay? I didn't get time to share this story in the morning service. It's a story of an ordinary man. His name was VJ. And if you saw VJ, you would you wouldn't think he's the kind of guy who's going to start a movement. He's such an ordinary guy. You know, he, he's just a village man. But VJ came to one of our trainings, and he learned about making disciples. And he, he heard the passage from Luke chapter 10 where Jesus sent them out to go and to, to heal the sick and to cast out demons and to proclaim the kingdom of God. He said, I want to go. I want to be willing. So VJ, he was walking through his village and he met some, some old friends. It was actually the parents of one of his school friends. And he met these parents and he greeted them, namaste. And he said, oh, how is my childhood friend? And they said, oh, haven't you heard? He's gone completely mad. VJ said, oh, what happened? You know, how did that happen? And they said, he's actually in the house. We have him chained to the bed. He doesn't even wear clothes. He's completely crazy. If we let him out of the chains, he just runs off here and there. And VJ knew he was demonized. And he said, can I pray for him in the name of Jesus? And they said, yeah, but like he, he's totally crazy. I don't know what he will do to you. And so VJ, he just gently went into that dark room where this man was chained to this bed naked. And he greeted him and he walked up to him and very gently, he laid his hand on him and he said, in the name of Jesus, you are free. Every demon has to go from you. And immediately the man fell, he shook and the demons left. And the man came back to his senses. An ordinary man with an extraordinary God can do extraordinary things. And that man who was set free they called and said, bring him clothes and bring him some food. And he came and he sat with his family for the first time in about 10 years. And that man became a leader, an elder in that house church movement that started in that area. Our God is a God of miracles. He's a supernatural God who lives inside of you. He is shifting us from addition to multiplication. We need to ask ourselves the question, are we shifting with him? Justin Long, I want to read this quote. He says, he's a, a statistician of church growth. He says, since the mid-1990s, we've witnessed the remarkable and explosive growth of disciple-making movements globally. With much of that growth happening in the past 10 years, from a very small handful of known movements in 1995, the number has grown to 1,850 movements globally, encompassing over 99.9 .9 million believers in 6.8 million churches, typically small 
house church gatherings. God is doing this. This is something he is busy doing. The question only remains, has your pain and God's passion met enough that you'll say, yes, I want to be involved in this. I'm ready to shift. I'm ready to change. I want to ask you to rise to your feet right now all over. Let's just rise to our feet. And let's just ask ourselves that question, God, am I stuck in the old ways of thinking? Or has my pain about lostness moved to the point where I'm ready to change? Would you turn up the fire inside of me? I'm willing to be a disciple maker. I'm willing to step out of my comfort zone, to lay my hands on a sick person and take a risk of faith and believe that God could touch them. I'm willing to step out and reach out to people who are not like me, who are different from me, because they need to hear the gospel and their lostness bothers me. Has your pain and God's passion met? Let's bow our heads. I want to pray for you. If you're here today and you would say, Cynthia, I want to change. I want to be willing. I don't understand it all. I don't know what it means for me exactly. But I want to move with God. I don't want to be left behind, stuck in the old paradigms. I want to move with what God is doing today. And I'm willing to step out of myself and be a disciple who makes disciples who make disciples. If that's you, I just want you to raise your hand all over this congregation. Raise your hand high. Raise your hand high, I wanna pray for you. You say, I wanna move with God. I'm willing to step out of myself and make disciples who make disciples. I don't wanna just be a follower of Jesus. I wanna be a follower who makes followers of Jesus. If that's you today, you would say, I'm willing. I wanna move with God. Change me, Lord, shift me. Raise your hand high. All over this congregation, I see those hands. God sees them. I wanna pray a prayer for you today. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, forgive us for the times we long for the old ways <laughs> and the old norms that were so comfortable and so familiar to us. But Lord, we say, God, we want to move with you. And disciple-making movements, church planning movements, is something you're doing in the world today. And as this church, we say we want to be a part of it. We don't want to be left behind. We want to move with you for the sake of lostness because it bothers your heart and we want it to bother ours enough to make us willing to change. Thank you, Lord, for those who have raised their hands today and said they're willing. Father, would you give them grace and wisdom to be like the sons of Issachar who discern the times and you show them what to do. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you so much. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you. Have our elder come. Thank you. God bless you guys. Please pick up a book. If you're interested in our online training, you can scan the QR code there as well. Or come talk to us afterwards. Thank you so very much.